to a world that is so steeped in evil of the declaration of the goodness of God. That God is altogether good. Altogether good. In the first church that I pastored, uh, 1971, there was an old man, uh, actually Pastor Joy and I were talking about him before the service, and I guess in my mind he's with me tonight. But he had two old hound dogs that uh, just, if, every time he opened the door to his truck, they jumped in, they slept by his feet on the front porch, everything. And uh, he thought it was great fun. He named them Goodness and Mercy, and they followed him all the days of his life. <laughs> And Bill thought it was the funnest thing in the world, named those hound dogs, goodness and mercy. I was thinking about him tonight, but listen to this. The goodness and the mercy of God will follow you all the days of your life. Amen? Well, praise him. Go on and praise him. And you can be seated. I'm uh, delighted to be back. It's been a while, and so I look forward to this. I'm very grateful to... Pastor Joy uh, for inviting me back for another series this spring or winter. Uh, I I'm, I'm used to be a university president, so I think of the spring semester starting in January. I don't know why we never called it winter semester. But uh, this, uh, this time now, 10 weeks, 10 Wednesday nights, I think there may actually be one in there that we, that we skip, but uh, 10 Wednesday nights. I have a new series, something I've never done before. I hope it is useful and that it works for you. I've really enjoyed getting started working on it. And then in the fall, I'll do um, a series of 14 Wednesday nights. And uh, I will tell you that series, what I want to do is something I haven't done here. I'm going to take uh, whole books of the New Testament on Wednesday night, and sometimes two or three books. For example, 1, 2, and 3 John, all in one Wednesday night. What I want to do is do a New Testament survey on the Wednesday nights in the fall of the entire New Testament. So we'll start with, uh, uh, well, not the entire New Testament, excuse me, the epistles. We'll start with Romans and, and do, do the epistles. I'm calling it You Have Mail, and uh, that it's the, the letters of the New Testament to the church. So we'll do those, uh, all those uh, epistles from Romans through to Revelation. A lot of people don't think of Revelation as an epistle, but it is. It's a love letter. So we'll start with Romans and work our way through. I hope you'll enjoy those. But this series is going to be different. I know this is a Bible study and not a, a prayer meeting, but I would um, like you to join with me in prayer. I want you to just say a prayer for two young men, uh, both of whom are interviewing at uh, positions, new ministry positions tonight and neither of them in Georgia, one is in Texas and one in uh, northern Alabama. And will you just join me and pray for them that God will, if those are the right doors, God will open them. And, uh, and if they're not, that God will close them, but God will give everybody clarity of thought. Will you join me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the people that are here tonight who have gathered in their numbers and to hear your word. And I pray that it will be illuminating and that your spirit will guide us, that you'll speak to me and through me, and I believe you for it. But God, I also want to pray for these two men. I pray for them that you will touch the hearts of everyone involved in the meeting tonight, that you will illumine those members of the uh, deciding group, that you will illumine them, that they'll give clear and, and answers that speak to the issues involved. I pray for both men. If these are the right positions, I know that you can make a way and that you can open the door that no one could even close. But Lord, I know that if these are the wrong positions for any reason, then we pray that you would just simply gently but firmly and decisively close the door and then give everyone in both meetings peace. I believe you for it. I thank you for it. Now, in this meeting here in this place, we ask also that you would give us the anointing and blessing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like just to begin with a brief testimony. I, I know this is not what you came for, and it's, it's an odd testimony because it's not about anything specific. How many of you, I asked several of you was coming in, has somebody at the end of December said to you, Happy New Year, Happy New Year? Anybody? People said that? How many of you are starting a Happy New Year? Anybody? 
No. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Someone. Now I'm seeing a few hands. I, can I make a, a, just a little testimony? I don't really even know why. I started the year as you did with a little fast. Um, not that you think spectacular or whatever. God has given me a burst of liberty and joy to start the new year. And uh, I, I wish I could think of something different I had done. <laughs> I'd do it every January. But uh, I think it's just a work of grace. But somehow, I'm, I'm just off to a great start. Can I testify to that? Is that all right? <laughs> when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I remember that immediate sense. Anybody else remember? <laughs> of almost giddy joy that I, I just uh, it was almost uncontainable when I first received the baptism so <laughs> I hope I don't start dancing here or something I embarrass myself if you have your Bibles now we'll begin tonight I want to speak on Jesus and Moses now, I, I hope that I can take this and that the Holy Spirit will help us to take it deeper than simply a, a comparison and contrast. Jesus did this, Moses did that, Jesus did this, Moses didn't do that. I, I, I pray that he will take us deeper than that. That there is some, some thing that he's teaching in this. And, and that we will move into this at a different level. It's, it's a study I've never done for my own study and it's a study I've never taught so we'll be experiencing it together if you have your Bibles take those first of all and we're going to read Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 Genesis 3 14 and 15 you'll notice it begins with the Lord God said so please notice God is speaking and the Lord God said unto the serpent because thou hast done this thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field and upon the, thy belly shalt thou go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Here's the key verse. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, thy seed, and her seed. Meaning, the descendants of satanic power, the seed of Satan, and the seed of the woman, that there will come a Messiah. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now to Genesis chapter 15. Again, God is speaking. But this time, in verses 13 and 14, not to Satan, but to Abram. You'll see it begins with, and he said. Meaning the Lord God. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. The broader prophecy is the Messianic prophecy. That the seed of the woman, a descendant of Mary, a descendant of Eve... Through the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman, from generation to generation to generation, from the Garden of Eden, this prophecy held. There will come a Messiah, a deliverer, a savior that will bruise the satanic head, that will, that will step on the devil and, and bring us out. But inside the story of that, which moves from the, that story moves from the, the Garden of Eden where God spoke to the serpent and to Adam and Eve, but in this passage, to the serpent. This God-given prophecy. Now think of, think of the distinction of what that means. That is not God speaking a prophecy through someone. In both of these passages, God is giving a prophecy himself once to Satan that through this woman whom you have tricked and beguiled and caused to sin and has introduced sin into the human race, but through this same human race, through this woman, 
ultimately, there will come Messiah who will bruise your head and set humanity free. But inside the extended story of the, of the final restoration through Messiah, there, is, there are woven stories of messianic type personalities like the wheel within the wheel. They are Messiah's little lowercase Messiah, Savior's lowercase s's, deliverers inside the story, the broader historical story of deliverance and the deliverer, there are these other deliverers, most notable of whom is certainly Moses. So God speaks to Satan. Think about this. He speaks to the serpent in the garden and reveals to Satan his long-term plan. There's, you, you're going to still operate. Humanity has fallen. Humanity has sinned. You're here. You're cursed. But through humanity, the seed of the woman, it's not going to be some angel that steps in from behind the curtain. Out of humanity will arise the ultimate deliverance of humanity. And this is the God speaking this prophecy himself. He is alerting Satan to his ultimate end. The seed of the woman will crush you. Then he comes yet again to Abram, and now he speaks a much more detailed prophecy. He says, look, your descendants, remember the Jewish people begin with Abram, who becomes Abraham. So Abraham is the primal Jew. So he says, your descendants will go into a foreign country and they will stay there 400 years. It turns out to be 430 years. They will stay there 400 years and gradually their stay there he tells him, we'll descend into servitude. You're, they're gradually going to become servants, slaves, in the nation where I'll take them. I'm going to take them to a foreign country. They'll be there four centuries. Four centuries. And they will become slaves. Don't you, don't you think that Abram must have wanted at that moment to say, Can, is it, do you have any other prophecies? you have something else? I thought you might promise me something good. But then he says, however, at the end of that time, they will come out rich. They will come out with great substance. They will come out with huge blessings. Now, these two stories then of Messiah, Emmanuel, and Moses, the deliverer, these two stories kind of roll within each other. And that's what I want to explore with you a little bit tonight. There is a, another prophecy given to Mary sent through the angel Gabriel who tells her exactly what's going to happen to her and the nature of the baby that she's going to have and his name, his, his destiny, his calling, to the mother of Moses, there is no stated prophecy as such. But there is this passage of Scripture, which it, it, it's not, it's one of those passages of Scripture that seems so small, and that yet you think it must be something huge. Because it just says, when she gives birth to the baby, if you'll remember, Pharaoh had ordered that all the male babies, all the Hebrew male babies, would be strangled. That the, the midwives, the Egyptian midwives, when the Jewish baby, Hebrew babies were born, if they were male, they were to be killed. And when she gives birth to a male child, it says, it just says, and seeing that he was a proper child, in the King James Bible, she determined to hide it. Now, weren't, all of them proper? Were there improper babies? But there must be something. Something said to her, this baby 
must be saved. Of course, it's the impulse of every mother. It's the impulse of every mother. It's that, but there was, there's something more here. There's something in this. So we don't have any account that Moses' mother receives an angelic visitation like Mary did. But somehow, she senses this baby must be saved. Now, since the two realities, as soon as Jesus is born, Herod, who is the king there, orders what? All the Hebrew babies, two years old and younger, who are males, all the little Jewish boys must be killed. And Mary and Joseph, certainly cognizant of the prophecy which she had been given and of the supernatural things that had been concomitant with Jesus' birth, ain't this angels, the star, the shepherds, the wise men, all of that. I mean, they realize certainly this is, this, this is not just every other baby. Any baby should be saved. But this baby must be saved. But how? How will this baby be saved? And so Joseph receives a dream, and an angel tells him, Arise and take the baby where? Egypt. <laughs> now, don't, don't you see the, the incredible confluence of ideas? Here's a baby boy under some kind of special circumstances, under an oppressive and genocidal king who must be saved and must be saved in Egypt. So they arise and go to Egypt. Moses' mother, sensing that her baby born under an oppressive and genocidal king must be saved. But she's in Egypt. Now, here's something that Americans who do not live with royalty do not understand. So when David, King David says, do good, O Lord, unto Zion, you have to understand that royalty feel that the state is embodied in them. So David is Israel, and Israel is David. Okay? So God says, this Hebrew baby born in a slave hovel, but must be saved, and I'm going to have him saved in Egypt by Egypt. So Jesus is saved in Egypt. Moses is saved alive in Egypt. He's born in Egypt, but by Egypt. And who is Egypt? Pharaoh. Now, I, I don't ever want to even verge on blasphemy, and I want to project onto God our human realities, but do you ever, am I the only one, do you ever just feel that God has a really unusual sense of humor? Is it just me that God says, Pharaoh has ordered that the Hebrew baby boys must be killed. So i tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give him one to raise in his house. So now, Moses, you see the comparison. Moses and Jesus are both saved from genocidal kings in Egypt and hosted by Egypt. Jesus then is called back out of Egypt. When, uh, when Herod dies... Then uh, an angel appears to Joseph yet again and says, all right, the, the king who wanted your son dead, he's gone. And that, all of that genocidal mania is forgotten. Take him out of Egypt. So Mary and Joseph leave. It's not clear, by the way, how long that is. There is debate between two years and six years. That between, in that period of time, Jesus is still a small lad whether a two-year-old toddler or a six-year-old. But at that period of time, they go back to Israel. So they must, he must be saved in Egypt. He must be saved by Egypt. And then he must come out of Egypt and back into Israel. Now, 
the Joseph story is the key to understanding the Moses story, which is critical to understanding the Jesus story. So God has to draw the Hebrew people to Egypt. So he uses the despicable betrayal of Joseph by his brothers to get him to Egypt, to get him to Pharaoh's palace, the same palace where Moses is going to be raised later on, generations later, 430 years later, Moses is going to be raised by the same royal line, and he's going to be raised there. But God's got to get the Jewish people there. So he uses the betrayal. What does Joseph himself say to his brothers? That which you meant for evil, God has meant for my good, but God has also meant for good, and God has also meant for a broader historical purpose, i.e., 400 years of slavery that will produce yet another Jewish man, another Hebrew, who will be born in Egypt, saved by Egypt, raised by Egypt, educated by Egypt, who is then going to crush Egypt. So, so God is like saying, I'm going to say this and this and this. I want you to hear that. Do you hear it? And we say, yes, Lord, we hear it. He said, okay, let me say it over here a different way. Do you hear it over here? We say, yes, Lord, that's different. He said, no, it's not different. It's the same thing, only it's different. <laughs> so the, the, the historical realities are layered. They are constantly reinforced, and then they are clarified. This is going to happen. Oh, I see it looks like this. Oh, I see it looks like this. Oh, it's going to lead to this. Any, is anybody in here old enough to remember that country music show that was on years from television for years called Hee Haw? Anybody remember this show? Well, they used to have this kind of vaudevillian routine that two of them did. I don't remember who the guys were. But they would have this thing. He said, my brother fell out of an airplane. And the guy would say, oh, that's terrible. He'd say, no, it's great. He fell into a haystack. Anybody remember this? They did this like every show. And then he'd say, fell into a haystack. Oh, that's great. No, it's terrible. He fell on a pitchfork. Oh, that's terrible. No, it was great. When he got off of the pitchfork, he found a diamond ring. Oh, that's great. No, it's terrible. There was a woman attached to it. And <laughs> so they did this like in every show. This almost is like that. It's like God says, I'm going to take Joseph and let his brothers sell him into slavery in Egypt. Oh, that's terrible. No, it's wonderful. He's going to become second only to Pharaoh. Oh, that's great. No, it's terrible. He's going to bring his family and they're going to become slaves for 400 years. Oh, that's awful. No, it's wonderful. The Hebrew nation will be formed as a people in slavery. Oh, Lord, we don't know if that's good or bad. So the, the point is, in this whole cycle of messianic mission, this transcendent flow of messianic work, there is this other work of God dealing with the Hebrew people and raising up a deliverer unto them. So Joseph's story to bring the Hebrews to Egypt is critical. They are there. What happens in Egypt is that what arrives in Egypt as a family, one family, 430 years later is a people, the Hebrew people. Two, we don't know this from scripture, but there were about two and a half million people. There are 500,000 males. People who estimate those things say that probably means Moses let out about two and a half million people. So in 430 years, one family in slavery has become a, a seminal nation without a nation, a people without a land. They are people. They have been formed in the, they've been formed in the womb of Egypt, in slavery. They've been born in slavery 430 years. There's nobody still alive who remembers Joseph or anything about Joseph. 430 years 
in bondage. But now, what began as a family in freedom is now a nation in bondage. And from that nation, in bondage, he now brings a deliverer. So, the daughter of Pharaoh goes down to the Nile River to bathe, and there she finds this baby hidden among the bulrushes, the famous story. And wrapped as he would be, probably in cloth that looked like slave's cloth. And being hidden as he is in the bulrushes. She is not confused. She knows it's a Jew. But somehow, her heart is struck. Somehow, it may be, is it the natural desire of a woman to save a defenseless little baby? Is it the supernatural power of God? Is it God coming upon her to, she, to cause her to shield this baby? We, we don't know. She pulls the baby out of the river, and she names the baby Moses. Now, that, that's a fascinating name, and there's a great deal of debate about it. So, in Scripture, in the, in the King James Bible, it says she named him Moses because she drew him out of the water, which seems, on the surface, on one hand, to imply that she named him Moses because the Hebrew for to draw out is, is a word that sounds like Moses. So there is one thought that it is a, a Hebrew name, meaning to draw out. But there's another way to read the passage. If a woman gives birth, doesn't she draw the baby out? She draws the baby out of her, so there is a sense in which she says, I didn't give birth to this baby, but I drew him out just as though I had drawn him out of my own body, I drew him out of the Nile. And the word Moses in ancient Egyptian means son. So is it a, a Hebrew name that means to be drawn out, or is it an Egyptian name that means that she says, this is my son whom, I, whom the Nile gave me. I drew him out of the Nile as though I had drawn him out of my own womb. And he is my son. He's my son. You can think of all the names in Egyptian that have some variation of Moses in them. Tutmos, the, the pharaoh Tutmos, the end of that word is Moses. Ramses, Ramoses, the, the derivative, of the basic of Ramses is Moses. In, in Arabic, it's Musa. In Hebrew, it's Moshe. But the name Moses is now almost beyond the ownership of any particular... Is it Egyptian? Yeah. Is it Hebrew? Yeah. Is it English? Yeah, sure, English. The name Moses, it's as though Moses becomes a name that transcends every tribe and race and nation, like Jesus. Like Jesus. So, as the Virgin Mary draws Jesus from her womb, the daughter of Pharaoh draws Moses, her adopted son, from the Nile River. And he is raised in the bosom of Egypt. It is one of the most remarkable stories in the whole Bible. That him who is going to destroy the Egyptian army who is going to free the Hebrew people, who is going to be the father of his nation, who is going to lead them in the wilderness and, and is going to be the lawgiver, who's going to encounter the God of, the, of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, is raised without any knowledge of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He's raised in the bosom of Egypt. He's educated as an Egyptian prince. He is the grandson of Pharaoh. And yet, at some point, he says, probably because his mother, who worked as his nurse in the, in the palace, at some point or another, finally, she got through to him, God got through to him, and he saw his call. And Moses, it says, in the book of Hebrews, it says he identified with the, with the Jewish people. 
at the risk to himself. He identified, he came into his identity. So he, he is hidden all these years from our view, raised as a, as a, and is an Egyptian prince in the palace. The, think of this, the grandson of Pharaoh. There is every possibility he could come to the throne. And yet, at some point, he says, I don't want to be an Egyptian. I don't want to be like these Egyptians. I don't want to be the grandson of the man who has raised me for 40 years. I want to identify with these people who live in slave hovels in Goshen. The moment of identification with his ultimate destiny. Jesus is raised in his not in Egypt, not in some adversarial thing, but in his father's tradesman shop. We say carpenter shop, stonemason, carpenter, whatever it was. His father was a tradesman, Joseph. He is raised there. We don't hear anything from him until he is 12 years old. And then he makes his identification with his mission. Knew ye not? I must be about my father's business. So he says... This business is not my business. This father is not really my father. And he steps out from a decidedly Jewish upbringing in the little village of Nazareth into an eternal and transcendent destiny. He identifies with his destiny and with his ultimate destination, heaven. Moses steps out of his upbringing, his training, his education, his culture, the food that he eats, the way that he thinks, everything. He's an Egyptian. Do you understand this? He's an Egyptian. He's 40. He's not a 12-year-old boy. He's 40. And he is in the corridors of international power. And he steps out of that and says, I'd rather be a slave. I'm a Jew. And he identifies with his ultimate destiny and his ultimate destination, the Holy Land. Now, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 11 is a fascinating passage. If you have your Bibles, would you turn there to Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, I should say. Hosea 11 and 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. So listen what he's saying. I summoned Israel out of Egypt. That prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus. My son, I have called back out of Egypt. Is that the fulfillment of the prophecy? Yes. But then he says, now I'm going to bring Israel out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Is that the fulfillment of the prophecy? Yes. What I'm trying to show you is that God is active, operative in history, layering truth upon truth, layering revelation upon revelation, reality upon reality, prophecy upon prophecy. Is this the prophecy fulfilled? Yes, yes, it is. No, it's not. I mean, it is the prophecy. It's just not the prophecy. Do you mean, do you mean we may be in bondage in Egypt? Yes, you're going to be in bondage in Egypt. It's just not going to be Egypt. You're going to be in bondage in the world. You're going to live in the world. You're going to be under the world, the world power. There's going to be, is it going to be Pharaoh? Yes, yes. Pharaoh will rule in the world. Okay, not Pharaoh. It's probably not going to be Egypt. It may not be Pharaoh. It's going to be some world power, some dominion, some force. And he says, you have to live in this. I'm calling you into it. You have to live there. You're here. I'm forming a people which were no people. 
I'm forming a nation which were no nation. I'm forming a people that had no access to the commonwealth of Israel, and I will make of them a nation of priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, which is no nation. Where will you do that? In Egypt. In Egypt? Well, Egypt. We're in the world. Jesus says you must be in the world. We, uh, I hope this is making sense to you. We are being fashioned as the holy nation of God who were nothing. We were no people. We, we were not a people. The Hebrews are a people. We were nothing. We're the offscouring of humanity. We're, we're leftovers from some tribes, nations, people, group. We're, we're not. We're not legitimately Hebrew people. But he says, I will make of you a nation, a church, a people. I will make of you a people that were not a people, a nation that wasn't a nation, of royal priests, a holy people, peculiarly mine, just like the Hebrews are mine, peculiarly mine. Where are you going to do this, Lord? In the world. In the world where there will be forces and dominion and power and kings and princes and armies and agencies. Where there will be people that will have the, the genocidal mania to slaughter babies. Just like Pharaoh did. Just like Herod did. He said the world is, all the whole world is Egypt. Every power, every force, every king is Herod. Every nation is Egypt. There's always going to be some force, some dominion, some agency of ruthless power. But I'm calling you to live in that. And he says, I'm not punishing you. I'm not punishing you. I'm fashioning you. I'm making you here just like I made Egypt. I'm calling you into this. I'm birthing you in this. I will draw you up. I will draw you up out of the river of mindless humanity. I will pluck you up out of the waters of destruction where you may have drowned or been eaten by a crocodile. And I will nurture you and fashion you and sanctify you while you are in the world. But remember... I will send someone who will take you out of the world and you will go out with substance. So, so the, the prophecy of 430 years of slavery was, was like not fun. Nobody wants that. Jesus says you must be in the world. We said, no, Lord, we'd rather come with you. He said, no, you can't come with me now. He says, if they have crucified me, who is the Savior, Messiah, and King of the universe, won't they do that kind of thing to you? If they have, if they have tortured me, why wouldn't they torture you? If they've imprisoned me, why wouldn't they imprison you? And we said, Lord, take us with you. He says, I will. We say, when? He says, not now. I will, but right now, I want you to be here. And we say, Lord, this, there's evil in this world. They're all like a bunch of, they're all like a bunch of Herods. They're all like a bunch of Egyptian pharaohs. All, the, the slaughter of the innocents, the, the torture, the, the, the horror, the immorality, the wickedness, the bondage, the violence... Oh, Lord, our cities are exploding in bondage. Why do you leave us here? To sanctify you holy. We say, Lord, we don't belong in this. He says, I am trying to tell you that. You're here, but you don't belong. You have to be in this. Moses was in Egypt. He was never of Egypt. No matter how he tried, and no matter how the household of Pharaoh tried, they could never make that little Jewish baby into an Egyptian. It was there. 
in the household of Pharaoh that he was fashioned as the deliverer of the Hebrews. It was he. We'll come to this later on in the study. You can look forward to it for nine more weeks. But there's going to come a moment when that same baby spared from genocidal murder suddenly said to someone next to him, blow the horn. It's time to go. Blow the horn. It was a great getting up morning when all the slaves arose and they took everything Egypt had and they got up from where they were and left where they had been, where they had lived as slaves under a dominion of other powers, and they left not as defeated and conquered slaves, but as victors. They left victorious with great wealth. So someday, Jesus is going to turn to someone next to him. (laughs) And he's going to say, okay, Gabe, Blow it now. And there'll be a great getting up morning. The dead in Christ shall rise. We also that remain alive shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And we're not leaving here as slaves. So what does it mean to you tonight in this place? Look, I, I can't be the only one in this house that sometimes I, Allison will say, Mark, you want to turn the news on? I said, no, no, not tonight. Let's just watch the Three Stooges. They're, they're doing the same thing, and it's funnier. No, I mean, you just look at the world. You look at the wars and the rumors of wars and the and the all of the stuff going on and the craziness and the violence and the spirit of murder and, and, and all of this that's happening. And you just think, God, I feel trapped here. God says, you're not trapped here. You're here because I have you here to sanctify you holy. In the midst of this, that when the trumpet sounds, you will rise as they did. Moses was the deliverer. He just wasn't the deliverer. He was a deliverer, a great deliverer. There was a trumpet that sounded. There was a people that got up and left where they were and left victoriously. But there's going to come a people that will hear another trump. And we will rise to meet him victoriously, filled with joy. So the craziness that we go through in this world. Listen, if you don't hear anything else in this whole series, can you hear this? God says, history is not happening to me. He said, if I can take a baby and put him from the Nile into the bosom of Pharaoh and make Pharaoh raise the child that will destroy him. I am the Lord of history. I am the Lord of history. I know that we see things which distress us. I know that we see these things. I see them. But I believe this. Jesus said, my gift to you is peace. In all of this, peace The trumpet is going to sound. Peace. We'll rise to meet him. Peace. A great getting up morning is coming. Peace. Herod didn't win. Rome didn't win. Egypt didn't win. The world doesn't win. Amen. Well, praise him and let's stand, will you? Will you stand where you are and just lift your hands for a moment and receive this word. And Jesus said, my gift to you is peace. Not the peace that this world gives, but peace 
beyond the comprehension of the Egyptians and the Herods and the Romans to comprehend. An eternal trans history, a historical eternal peace. Receive, he says, my peace. Now let's worship him. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Forever. Come on, sing it again. Lift your hands up. Let's sing it together. Come on, peace. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. Peace. Coming down from the Father. Coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit. Sweep over my Think of this spirit. Word. Forever. 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 Fathomless billows of love. In fathomless billows of love. Come on, just one more time. Lift your voice up and rejoice in it. Peace. 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 Wonderful peace. Coming out from the Father above. Thank you for being here for this first in this series. I hope the series will be a blessing to you. And I just want you to know, even if it isn't, I'm being blessed in preparing it. So I'm enjoying it. I want to thank Pastor Joey for his willingness to come and preach at our son's church in Bethlehem. It means a great deal to me that he would come and share with him and his church at Restoration Church. And that he would invite you to come and share in that service. It touched my heart. So I hope to see all of you next Sunday night. I, I'm preaching in the morning in Damarest, Georgia, but I'll be back in time to hear Brother Joy preach and to see many of you. God bless you. Peace be unto thee. Amen. Praise God. He stole my sermon. He's a witness to this because I told him we were sitting in the steakhouse and I was talking about how history is viewed wrong and how we've changed it. And he said, I'm preaching on that tonight. And I'm like, you're stealing my material. But God has really been dealing with me about this very subject. I, I, I feel like there's a prophetic connection for this very word. Someone came to me and they, it encouraged them and me when they asked it. They said, you know, I know it gets worse and worse. I know what things will. I said, no, no, no. We keep winning till it comes. The Antichrist cannot rule while the church is triumphant. Hallelujah. Everything continues. Just as Pastor said tonight, it oscillates. It, 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 from, from Egypt to the judges to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to, to Jesus Christ, to the to the ascension, to, to the John on the Isle of Patmos, to, to the days of Hitler, to, to the modern time, all of these things, they keep speeding up, and all you do is you keep seeing chaos, chaos, chaos until come the synapse. We're getting close. Pharaoh's falling all around us, but God is rising among us. And, and, and one last little thing that the Lord's been telling me, and I want to say it right here at this moment, I should wait till Sunday, it'd be a great sermon, but I don't know that I can wait. There's going to be a revival of peculiar. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You can't fake peculiar. 
And I believe that's what's been missing from the modern church is we've blended in. And I believe that what he's talking about tonight, that, that great oscillating historical context of revival is coming like the night train. COVID was an interruption. It was a fake. It was, it was the, not fake in terms of it being a fake virus. It was a real virus, but it was a fake shadow of what God is about to do. The Lord is going to do something mighty in this earth. We know it because his word tells us. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Dr. Rutland. I thank you, God, for him choosing to, to bring such a complicated thought and make it plain. To do the hard work of studying out this, this incredible symmetry between the two lives of both Moses and Christ and taking that word and bringing it to where we live and bringing this, this attitude of peace midst of chaos and I ask you God take this word right now bury it in our hearts Heavenly Father that we might not sin against you but be what you called us to be call us out of the water God call us out of slavery one more time in Jesus precious and mighty name and all God's people said aloud victorious amen 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 God bless you I love you we'll see you on Sunday <laughs>